Hello, I'm Jeff Nyquist, and I'm in the United States, and my colleague Alex Benish is with us in Germany, and we're going to be talking about WikiLeaks and how the Russian special services, or this, the, the old KGB, used WikiLeaks, and to what purpose, how people get used by these services, and of course, last week we talked about how those services can use the UFO cults and whatnot. And I think a lot of people enjoyed that. Um, I did not, I had meant to read the letter that um, Senator Schumer wrote uh, threatening the U.S. military industrial complex. It's very interesting how all these narratives, whether it's about UFOs or WikiLeaks or whatever, it's always turned around on the government, on the U.S. government, on U.S. intelligence, on blocking U.S. military. Uh, and always the bad guy is the U.S. military industrial complex. You never hear about the Russian military complex. You hear about the CIA being behind everything from the Kennedy assassination, um, you know, to the to the bugs in your bed. Uh, but the, the 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 reality is is that um, really the the services to watch are the Chinese and the Russians. So so Alex, why don't you start off talking about this WikiLeaks stuff? Well, now that you mentioned UFOs, I mean, I don't remember any UFO stuff getting posted on WikiLeaks. Maybe some uh, somebody in the comment section can remind us because I, I was very deep into that case when it happened. That was like in 2010. Uh, so that's a long time ago. I know it's 14 years ago, but um, I got really deep into the case and I don't specifically remember them doing um, big leaks on supposed alien UFO stuff, but maybe somebody actually remembers that and can put that in the comments. Because, I mean, WikiLeaks would be the ideal place, right? I mean, if, if uh, you know, somebody had a video of something or, uh, you know, uh, some supposed report or whatever, maybe some new Majestic 12 fake documents, I mean, WikiLeaks would have been the perfect place um, to post well, this there's stuff. actually uh, WikiLeaks UFO files, hidden UFO and alien secrets, which is mm, uh, some kind of a spiral. Uh, uh, Gil <laughs> Carlson put that out, and and Julian Assange is an author on that. But I I've never looked at that. I don't know what uh, they they claim to have a whole book full of government UFO files from WikiLeaks. <coughs> uh, and but but it seems to me when you read um, when you read uh, Senator Schumer's letter, uh, it's basically you know, the U.S. military uh, companies, military contractors, defense contractors are somehow guilty of some kind of terrible crime of withholding technology that could make the lives of Americans better. And that th this is somehow being used to frame them to to mean that we, we have to have an investigation of defense contractors. And goodness knows it's so strange. Uh, but do you, when you have Russia and China attacking on the attack, preparing a war against us, the Russians are actually fighting a war in Ukraine. The Chinese are preparing some kind of action in Taiwan. The West is so concerned we're going to send seven or eight aircraft carriers sometime this year out there. And I just talked to Mr. Wang of Luda Media last night, and he his information is is that they're planning to ambush the carriers that are sent out to Taiwan. That that they're going to create unrest in Taiwan. And they're going to create a crisis around Taiwan. And when our aircraft carriers come there, it's like they got like flypaper there, naval flypaper to trap the carriers, yeah. destroy some of the carriers. And they've got some kind of a, a nefarious plan. And uh, so, so look at who's under attack. We're trying to bring our military. We're behind military up to par. We're trying to get nuclear weapons going. I, I had somebody online on, on my site say, oh yeah, we're building new nuclear weapons. Oh no, it turns out they were just taken apart. When, when I questioned them, they're just taking apart older weapons to try to refurbish them to keep them in, in good shape. But we, the last I've heard is 2029 is when we're going to get new nuclear warheads for the U.S. Well, we're behind. Our warheads are past their shelf life. We're trying to maintenance them to keep them working. Yeah. Uh, it's a very delicate thing. How much longer the Minuteman 3, half of the tests of the last four or five years have failed on the Minuteman 3. That's, for, what, 450 ICBMs that we really only have, if the tests are at accurate reflection, 225 that work yeah. if the tests are a reflection of the state um, of those things. Yeah, I mean, when you when you mention that, um, it's I mean, t uh, espionage will play such a great role in a potential third world war, and and already, I mean, we we have uh, new research that tells us a lot about 
um, espionage and uh, sabotage in World War II. And I, I've written about this in my new book. People can uh, find the link in the description below. It's called um, Real Anti-Communism and the Third World War. And um, so w when you have spies running around everywhere, of course, you need tools to catch these spies, you know, the Chinese and the Russians and, and, and quite a few other uh, characters. You have to catch them somehow because these people, they hide behind freedom. They hide behind anything that's taken for granted in, in the U.S. Um, because the U.S. Is, is the U.S. It's not Russia where you can just, you know, uh, when they can just put you in prison for literally anything. And, and there's no media to do an outcry for you. There's no uh, lawyer that can save you. You cannot sell the rights to your story to a movie studio and become famous. And surely after in Russia, when you leave prison, you're not going to become an honorary professor at some leftist university. So um, we need tools to catch spies because spies can actually shift the, the, physical, um, the physical balance of power. You know, this is not just some information that is being taken out of the United States and then used by the Russians. There's also uh, bad stuff coming into America, and it's 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 oftentimes it's sabotage. So you're not just stealing. Well, the American other thing is is psychological sabotage, uh, disinformation. I mean, you look at uh, Yuri Bezmenov's statements about demoralization, saying that. What was it he said? 80% of the spies are not collecting information. They're basically creating narratives or, or putting out disinformation. And that this is a, a kind of warfare that the Russians specialize in, and they specialized in it. They were doing it in World War II, but now in, after the, they perfected it in the Cold War, they are salting our airwaves. People that you trust, people in the media, whether you're on the left or the right, there's people in the media that are putting out messages that are just subtly tweaked by strategy experts in Russia, in China, to get you to misunderstand what you're hearing. And they call it perceptions management. It's very important. It's, there's, there's, there's a number of things. If you can interfere with a person's ability to perceive or to understand facts, so that they, they especially it's, it's got to do with framing, which framing is all about changing the context of what you see. So if you see uh, a strange object in the sky that could be intrusions of, of, of the Chinese or the Russians into our skies before a war, you know, reconnaissance, turn it into a UFO story. Turn it into the, the then the sightings, the meaning is changed because the frame has been changed. The framing is different. Same thing with uh, with the war in Ukraine. They framed it so that, oh, it's bankrupting America when actually other things are bankrupting America. That's a tiny expense, the supporting the war in Ukraine. Um, and, and, and so they, they change the way people see the events and the facts. And it's a huge thing because what I've encountered in America, and you've probably seen it, Alex, in Germany, is that almost everybody's disoriented. Tucker Carlson's a good example of a disoriented journalist quote unquote, uh, many of our politicians are disoriented. When you watch, when I watch Fox News, I have to sometimes turn it off because you get into a blind yeah. rage saying you're getting all this wrong. How can yeah. you be getting this wrong? And it's like when you talk about framing, I mean, it's like framing, um, framing aims to uh, establish a gimmick. It's sort of a, a reflex, a reflex judgment in the audience. It's almost like watching a stereotypical Hollywood movie where you can already guess the plot because you've seen so many movies that have virtually the same plot. Um, or you're just, it, it's like you think you know what this is. And so when once they give you this, this framework, you jump to conclusions and you think you've solved the case. You think that, for example, you think that Assange is a journalist, that Assange, Julian Assange of, of WikiLeaks, he stands for truth and he's, he's he's you know he's the press and evil US government just wants revenge you know and and it's all about this fascist imperialist pigs and uh, Mr Assange he um messed things up for them and now they want to take revenge <clears throat> just like people believe you know that the military industrial complex killed John F Kennedy because Kennedy was such a lefty they say and he messed things up for them and that's why 
you know, they they, they, they killed JFK. But I mean, yeah, that's, ju- that's clearly a, communist framing yeah. right there. And, and also, and also, there's also an interesting parallel there. Um, remember, remember J- uh, John F. Kennedy's speech to the newspaper publishers, warning about a monolithic communist conspiracy. He was telling yes. these people to be careful because there are limits to publishing classified intelligence. And, and even if it's not that highly classified, it can be a problem. So he was talking to these publishers and, and really these uh, conspiracy activists to this day, they, these activists believe John F. Kennedy was talking about the Illuminati. When he yes. spe- when he says the yeah. words monolithic conspiracy and they what was what's the other terms he used um uh yeah he said that uh, that it's a, it's it's abhorrent for people yeah. to have a secret Beca- groups that exactly wor- secret you know, societies and, and secret and proceedings and so when and- they and so they they take that part of the speech out they present it in a in a video in a YouTube video and then they leave the rest of the speech out they take away the context and they create a completely different context for it. And I've, I've heard that and been enraged by hearing it. It's like, this isn't even honest. These people know, those yeah. people that have heard the whole thing know exactly what the speech is about. It's about communism. It's yeah. not about the Illuminati. It's not about the Bilderbergers. <laughs> it's not about the Council on Foreign Relations. Sorry, you might yeah. not like these liberal globalist type ideas, but communism is really using everybody. Yeah. It's using and, the right, it's yeah, using and... the left, it's using the globalists. And just as you said, with the, the framing, they framed... They framed the whole JFK assassination uh, as fascist imperialist pigs, and he was the hero. And now they frame Assange in the same way. Now he w- he wants to be the martyr. He wants to be Nelson, uh, as famous as Nelson Mandela. He wants to play the victim, right? Um, and so uh, they're scaring everybody that he gets killed. You know, he he would he would die when he gets to the United States when they deport him. So they're framing it in the same way they framed the Kennedy assassination. Um, but Kennedy, uh, Kennedy was was uh, really really against Soviet communism. He was very very tough on that. Um, and um, it's like I I called my book um, "Real Anti Communism and the Third World War," and because real anti communism is based on counterintelligence. It's not primitive right wing extremism. It's not conspiracy media. You know, it's not just superficial uh, stuff against wokeness and, and and all of that. And so the the biggest framing, I think, that the left has gotten away with, um, I think the biggest framing is the following. They they want to make anti they equate anti-communism with fascism. They say it's the same thing. If you're against if you're if you're against communism, you're a fascist imperialist pig. And that's the baseline uh, dogma to them. So anything is within that framework. So, um, so you're, you're and then and then the other framing they do is they framed it so that uh, look, communism is just a bunch of crazy kids or fanatics who are going to grow out of it, and it, it it has no real serious meaning. There's no real communist conspiracy because why? And this goes back to the 1980s. Nobody believes in communism anymore. Not even the communists believe in it. Very interesting. So it's like, is the Pope Catholic? Yeah. Right. And of course, the Pope isn't Catholic, but he's still the Pope. Right. So you have there's a this is what makes communism so complicated is that communism. You could talk about communism as a belief system, which most people think it's an economic system, which is flat wrong. Economics is just one thing that Marx wrote about. It's about revolution. It's about power. It's about seizing power. And uh, it, it's not just about belief. In fact, Marx and Lenin said it's not a belief. It's a science. It's a science. Lenin's words were, it's the science of the management of human affairs. Well, that makes it sound like it's just political science. Well, they call it historical sciences. In the Soviet Union, if you got a degree in, in that, you, you, were, you were an expert on Marxist, Leninist theories about things. And, the th- and what is a theory? A theories can change, right? So it's even something that can change. And but what really what they don't understand is that when the organization is communist and it's following certain methods like the Communist Party of China or the Communist Party Soviet Union or the different uh, I I call them secret structures, structures set up by the KGB and the communists. And then you have people saying, well, the KGB is different than the party. Well, no, the KGB was always the armed part of the Communist Party. 
It was to be in the KGB without a communist party is an oxymoron. Yeah. And it's you like, can't, it's like being, yeah, yeah, it's like being in a, being a Californian and not being an American. Yeah. And I, I, I have a chapter, I have a chapter in the book where I compare the, um, the communist intelligence style with, you know, Western intelligence style, you know, so many Western, many Western, um, uh, intelligence agents, you know, foreign agents, uh, for, you know, using foreign postings, they treat this like a job. Uh, they want to work life balance, you know, they, they don't make that much money. And, um, sometimes they leave, for example, the CIA after just a few years. So they gain all this experience and then they work for a, a corporation. And, uh, so this is like, it's, it's like, you know, spy business can be very slow moving and, um, you set up a meeting with a source in a neutral country and nothing comes out of it. And every, every step takes weeks and weeks and you spend all this time in boring hotel rooms, not in casinos. Um, so, um, but when you're intelligence, intelligence officer, an intelligence officer uh, for the Russians, you know, with a foreign posting, you are in a maniacal cult. They expect you to take, um, man, you know, insane risks. They want you to, um, and they threaten you if you betray them. Um, they will, they will, you know, kill you. They will uh, torture you, torture you alive. They will harm your family. It's a different, it's a different style of intelligence. Now, of course, we saw some people in in, in America uh, getting into a lot of trouble. You know, like the Robert Hansons or one of one of the sources of WikiLeaks. Actually, I have a story here. Um, this was uh, just a few weeks ago. Here yeah, it was in the New, in the New York Times uh, headline: CIA computer engineer who leaked secrets is sentenced to forty years. Joshua Schulte, thirty-five, who transmitted classified information to WikiLeaks, also faced child pornography charges. Before his sentencing, he complained about his treatment in jail. So this was the guy who gave WikiLeaks um, the hacking tools. So this was these were intrusion uh, intrusion tools that the American intelligence uh, community was using to break into the systems of terrorists and foreign hostile uh, agent agencies. So these and were And tools. it was exposed. And yeah, was so exposed. these were these were tools and, and they were used in active operations. And then this guy leaks this because he's pissed, you know, he's, he's, he's mad at his bosses or his superiors. So he leaks this stuff to WikiLeaks. They put it up. <clears throat> and so who knows how many active operations are compromised or threatened because right. now these these tools are exposed. So this has real world implications, yeah. ongoing ongoing investigations, ongoing operations. This is absolutely horrible. So this guy got well, 40 I, years I in prison. I should mention, you know, to reinforce your point about um, espionage means, uh, Lenin wrote one of his earlier works, What is to be Done?, Right. And in this book, he basically outlines his plan, his future plans for a conspiratorial revolutionary party, which was which became, of course, the Communist Party. Um, and why conspiratorial? He said, because we're fighting. They were fighting the Tsarist regime. The Tsarist regime had tremendous counterintelligence resources. And, and there is a sense in which when you fight a certain enemy, you have to adopt their tactics. You have to get to know them. You become them in a sense. So what Lenin was doing is saying, we have to outwit the Okhrana. We have to be able to outwit the Tsar's secret police. And that means we have to adopt secretive conspiratorial tactics to, to prevail. And of course, not only did they prevail with their secretive tactics, but they also took over the secret police so that the Akrana itself came under Lenin. And of course, they were able then to get control of their files and learn everything. And you had here you had this Tsarist regime that for the better part of 400 years since Ivan the Terrible was relying on the, the secret agent networks, uh, provocation, uh, controlled opposition, all the things that now are used as words by people who don't really know the history of where it comes from. And of course, where did the Moscovites learn this from? Well, in China. The, the Chinese history is, is more about spies than it is yeah. about great generals. You know, we've got Alexander the Great and Caesar. They have these sages, they call them. They're, they're philosophers or they're sages of cunning, right? And, and the, the, the earliest re record of a fake defector 
is from China, 1900 BC. It's the oldest written record, which is in this book on Chinese espionage that I have, which really astonished me. But it's, it's mm -hmm. these Eastern techniques that we in the West, we believe in free society. We have collegial institutions. Their collegiality is different. They're all about yeah. secrecy. Yep. And when you live in a tyranny, by the way, every person that lives in a tyranny where you're not free to speak your mind, you have, you, you censor yourself. Yeah. And you are very careful about what you say. So you live a guarded life. So already you're better prepared by your upbringing for conspiracy than someone raised in the US or Germany. Yeah. I mean, it should be taught in school how enemy intelligence agencies operate i mean the just the fundamentals of what you need to look out for because i mean it, it's nice to have it's nice to have a free republic but you know these assets they use um all these liberties to hide behind them and um and to leverage public opinion really so a guy like assange um and and you know this 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 guy who leaked information to assange i mean they they want to be regarded as heroes you know i mean usually you're a hero if you catch enemy spies, if you harm enemy operations. But now you're supposed to be a, a hero when you uh, sabotage your own country's defense, right? So um, harming your own country is now considered a good thing. It's whistleblowing. It's, it's nice and dandy and it's going to save us all. And so um, uh, Julian Assange never acted like a journalist. He had no training as a journalist. And he was not an expert about war and intelligence. Everyone knows journalism has boundaries. You cannot post mountains of classified data and, uh, you know, endangering people in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, people who gave intel to coalition forces against the radicals. Now imagine, imagine if a traitor like Robert Hansen had not sold his intelligence to the Soviets, but published it on the web and accepted donations. Could he have claimed to be press? Certainly not. Now, Assange can expect a normal trial because America is not Russia. And uh, notice the influencers talking trash about Navalny or ignoring Navalny, but they will glorify Assange and turn him into a martyr, right? Um, and in a courtroom in the United States, we may finally get more information, you know, things that were previously classified about the damage he may have caused. We may see blurred, blurred out photos of dead sources from Afghanistan and Iraq and dead family members. We, we may get internal info from within WikiLeaks because there was a young informant inside WikiLeaks who handed over hard drives to the U.S. government. Uh, witnesses may explain things. And of course, Assange does not want this. Neither do the Russians. Um, he is worth he is worth more dead than alive right now to the Russians. So watch out for that. Um, and uh, WikiLeaks WikiLeaks could have simply used bits from the material they had, turned it into a story with context. So the United States could not the the U.S. couldn't leave Iraq and Afghanistan overnight without radicals taking over, and Iran was heavily supporting the radicals. But Assange wanted the sensation. He wanted the staggering number of documents out. He wanted to be the man who, quote, ended two wars. So this is when a guy like Assange suddenly gets power. And immediately that guy abuses his power. And he doesn't care who, uh, who gets harmed in the way. And so uh, WikiLeaks was always part of a larger older global movement of hackers and activists. So um, this really started in the 80s, right? Um, and so that's when you already had organizations such as uh, the, the German Chaos Computer Club. So these were guys who were using who were using all kinds of techniques to gain access where they shouldn't be getting access. Now, this is, of course, the essential skill of a spy, right? You have to improvise. You have to impersonate somebody else. You have to claim you have the right to access this and use all sorts of trickery. And this is what these guys did. So um, even before the early internet, they called it freaking. Now, this is when they, um, they used a small type of whistle and they were uh, whistling certain tones into a telephone to make long-distance calls for free because the system was set up in a way that um, 
there was a, a communication by these tones. So if you mimic those tones, you can, you know, have long distance calls for free, for example. Or classic technique, uh, you pick up the phone, you call somebody and say, oh, hi, this is, you know, you know, you call somebody at his workplace and say, oh, oh hey, here's John from the accounting department. Uh, we lost some some stuff here. Uh, can you please tell me this and that? And, you know, quite a lot of times this person would then give you information because he thinks you're John from the accounting department. So this is how it started. And then these activist groups like the Chaos Computer Club that was linked to WikiLeaks, these activists, um, they wanted to appear legit, but then something happened. And that is commonly referred to as the KGB hack. Now, this is part of hacker hacker legend, okay? So this was um, the, late nine, the late 80s, okay? So this was um, 1985 until 1989. German hacker group um, headed by Karl Koch, and the other guy was Markus Hess. Now, old school hackers, they know these names. There were Hollywood movies done about them. And uh, so these were, um, these guys, they broke into American systems. The same stuff that Assange did when he was young and he got caught. Um, they broke into American systems, stole information, and they sold this information to the KGB to finance their cocaine habits, right? Uh, well, at least this one guy, Karl Koch, he was a cocaine addict and he, he spent his money on more cocaine. Now, um, when, uh, when, uh, so when they broke into a United States university, um, when they, they broke into a United States university, a very smart American man uh, noticed a discre discrepancy and he improvised an intrusion detection system, kind of like an early firewall, right? So he collected all the printers from the university and he installed them at the entry points of the system that they had so that the printers would start printing out the log files of what was happening in real time. So this is how he could find the intrusion points. So then he figured out because of the time when these hackers were active, he figured out they must be from a specific time zone, you know, on Earth. And this time zone was the German, West German time zone. So they, he gets into contact with the German authorities and they finally actually catch these hackers. And um, this Karl Koch guy, he ended up dead, um, burnt to death for whatever reason, it's still not exactly clear who killed him or if he killed himself, may have been the Russians, who knows. Um, and so this became a gigantic embarrassment for the hacking community, which was very left-wing. Uh, and so the the German Chaos Computer Club, they um, they, they wanted to be ver appear very legit, so they did activism with publicity stunts. So they were finding some security flaw in the mobile phone system, they got attention for that. And more and more, they kept doing activism against government tools needed to catch Soviet spies. So they hate, I mean, up to this day, they still exist to this day. So they hate surveillance cameras, which are a nightmare for spies. Um, they hate biometric systems, which spies completely hate. Um, they hate uh, databases in general, anything useful they are against. And so this is kind of the larger activism scene that uh, these people came out of. Um, what I got here is the book by, uh, this is the book by Daniel Berg. He's the German guy who joined WikiLeaks early and became sort of the number two guy um, for quite a while. And uh, this, this, this character, this Daniel Berg, he was a member of the Chaos Computer Club. Now, uh, this organization was founded in the office of a left-wing newspaper. And they had the table, the, the actual table, I think, of the first communist commune in Western Germany. So they saw this table as sort of a a relic as something very, very important and honorable. So they were proud they had An this table. An unholy relic? Uh, so to say, yeah. This was um, this was very important to them. So, um, and um, 
And so, yeah, and so this was kind of where these people came from. Now, Julian Assange, essentially, when he was a young kid, like 16, 17 years old, Assange, he did, Assange did the same stuff that these German guys had done. You know, Karl Koch, you know, the legendary hackers for the KGB, you know. Uh, Assange did the did the exact same, same thing, used the exact same techniques. He broke into American systems. And he got caught and then he sort of collaborated with the police in Australia and Victoria um, to catch child pornographers on the web and stuff like that. And we don't know the full extent of what he did for police. Um, And so because of that work, he got off easy um, when it came to his hacking charges. I mean, some people say he could have gone to prison for 100 years for what he he did Um, because every intrusion became an expensive problem for America. I mean, you know, the hackers always said, well, he didn't break anything, he didn't sell anything or whatever. But if there is an intrusion, it's a thing, you know, it, 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 it costs money to fix, there has to be a security review, what was compromised possibly, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So he caused a lot of financial damage and he, he, um, he caused Americans to waste their resources on a security review. So that's why he could have gone to prison for like 100 years. But instead, he gets a small fine, a very small fine, and he gets off because he collaborated with police. But he is known to be a very, very vindictive character. He hates authority, um, and and he's he's just very vindictive. So he hates the system, the Western Anglo system. He totally hates it, apparently wants to destroy it, and this is how he uh, came to start WikiLeaks because it was a stressful time. Of course, he was a young father, I believe, uh, very soon thereafter. Um, he, uh, he, he barely stayed out of prison. And, um, and he, was in, in, um, he was in therapy at the time, if I remember correctly. So very stressful time. And he thought, well, the system was at fault. The system did this to him. So he wants to break it. He wants to just smash it and destroy it like a little kid. Um, and so uh, then he starts to work. He actually gets a real job and he makes some money. And apparently he wanted to use that money to travel the world. Um, it says the Eastern Bloc, but it's very, very murky because he's a liar. I mean, he wants to represent the truth, but when it comes to himself, there's no transparency. He lies about everything. And even this guy, this German guy, Daniel Berg, was a sen- who was essential in creating, you know, building up WikiLeaks, Daniel Berg was noticing that this guy constantly lies. He told several different versions of every story. He told completely false, improbable stories. And so there's a lot of stuff we don't know about Julian Assange. There is like a five to eight year gap in his um, in Assange's history. There's years where we don't know where he was and what he did, right? So um, he, he starts to create WikiLeaks in 2006, round about 2006. And, uh, and, and I want people to notice the timing, okay? So, um, so during the Bush years, the Russians were careful in their propaganda. They, they, the Russians did not want attention for themselves. They wanted to trash the United States. Um, but everything, everything changed around 2008. 2008 is the year of the, the Georgia invasion and, and more aggress, aggressive Russian propaganda. And right at that time, 2008 forward, this is when WikiLeaks became a thing. And um, uh, so... This um, this German guy, this German guy Daniel Berg, he's fairly left wing, um, w- an early French communist author. I think it was Pierre Joseph Proudhon. It's his favorite author. I mean, that guy was was just just an idiot communist uh, and very anti-Semitic, by the way. This Proudhon guy, but he loves communist ideology, Mr. Berg, and. Uh, his wife, his later wife, she's a communist politician. She's actually um, a politician for the extreme left party, which is the successor of the Soviet East German um, party, right? So um, so that guy, Daniel Berg, he hears about WikiLeaks 
and he wants to join and he actually gets to join and so he he manages he 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 invites Julian Assange to Berlin uh, for the annual big hacker convention of the Chaos Computer Club. Now, this is a big event and they always whine about, you know, surveillance and, and, and stuff. Uh, so um, nobody at this point really knows about WikiLeaks. So Assange gets to speak in, in a basement room, basically, in front of 20 people. So this was the first official presentation um, of WikiLeaks. And and then things started to happen. These leaks started to happen. And it was always questionable where this material came from. Because um, the way the WikiLeaks system was set up was an anonymous Dropbox. It's like an anonymous mailbox. You can use a specific online technology to submit stuff. And WikiLeaks could then claim we had no idea where this comes from. And this is a form of, I call it data laundry. It's like money laundry, but for data. And so for data that's come from classified sources, um, classified sources could be, uh, you know, could be any source whatsoever. It could be an intelligence agency, you know, they they could claim they don't know where it comes from. Well, yeah, for example, in this WikiLeaks book, uh, about UFO leaks, there's they've stole documents from Stratfor the, the really? private oh, yeah. intelligence yeah. company. And of course, it's all this stuff about uh, what's interesting is, is, is there in throughout this Assange book on, on UFOs and WikiLeaks and Julian Assange is the co-writer of it. It's all framed as get this, the Kennedy was assassinated because he was going to share UFO oh, yeah. alien stuff with the Russians. Right. And Marilyn Monroe was killed because JFK pillow talked about <laughs> aliens to her. No, I'm not kidding. That's in this this thing. And not only that, but but here's a here's a quote from from it, which which they don't allow. You know, they skip over this part, but it's from Stratfor, um, and it's about UFOs, and it's it's actually turning it back on the Russians. So if you read it with care and you understand, they're trying to frame it so you ignore this part. Uh, this is from the Stratfor UFO files by 1949. Military intelligence authorities had classified the flying saucer phenomenon as top secret, and Army Commander-in-Chief had passed on information that the Soviets may have developed saucer-shaped aerial weapons capable of delivering atomic bombs or dissipating radioactive materials over NATO countries mm -hmm. as a stopgap measure to make up for the non-existent nuclear weapons arsenal. And that was before they, oh, for later wow. in 49, they got the bomb. But yeah. that's interesting, huh? And um, <laughs> that originally they thought it was the Russians. Mm -hmm. Right? Oh, boy. So it's, it's, it's very interesting. And, of course, when they talk about space-based weapons, a lot of this is about uh, uh, astronaut Edgar Mitchell uh, writing letters to John Podesta about how he's concerned about the military industrial complex. And the thing is, oh no, the Americans, they want to put weapons in space and they're going to say that it's, you know, it's, it's going to be aimed at the Russians, but they're going to claim that it's to stop an asteroid or to stop aliens. Mm -hmm. That's their last card they're going to play is this, it's there to stop aliens. I mean, it's, um, yeah. they, they'll do anything to get your attention to their disinformation spin. Yeah. I mean, I, I mentioned this in the last show, I think, um, when usually, many traders were motivated by money they would walk into a soviet embassy and say hey i got access to classified intel will you pay me money uh and the kgb loved that because they thought you know at least this guy's honest to us you know he's just in it for the money the other th motivation of course was ideology um for people to become traders but with this whole ufo alien stuff basically um there was um with this whole alien ufo stuff there was another motivation created for people to steal secrets and leak them. So it's not for the money, it's not for a communist ideology, but they think that they're just doing a great service to the world. It's, they, it's um, curiosity. They want to know the truth about yeah. something. And it's also, there's environmentalist motivation because what I, and one of the things yeah. that this book claims is that global warming, the solution for global warming is an alien zero point energy technology. Uh -huh. See, we could stop global warming. Right, if we got Anything. this zero point alien, and so they get people to we can believe stop this hair loss. Nonsense. We can stop hair loss, male yes. pattern baldness. Um, I forgot to mention one thing. This is from uh, 
this was from Austrian Austrian media, uh, one of the biggest newspapers there. Um, they talk about this old famous hacker case, you know, Karl Koch, um, which was the case was turned into a movie. I think it's the movie's called I think Twenty Three. People can find it online. It's called Twenty Three. Uh, nothing is what it seems. Um, I'm translating this here. Um, and so this 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 character, um, this character Karl Koch, this infamous hacker, he was also a truther. He was into conspiracy books, and he started to see signs everywhere because he was on drugs and he was reading this conspiracy stuff. And so, um, um, yeah, probably it was the same motivation that we saw with the famous trader um, John Walker with the Navy, because Walker in the Navy was also a truther. He read all these John Birch Society books, and he believed in the grand conspiracy, and he thought uh, the USSR was the smaller problem, right? So maybe that was the exact same framing for the infamous hacker Karl Koch. Again, it's all about framing. You know, if you make people believe certain axioms, you know, certain foundational beliefs, and you can make them believe all kinds of stuff. And what I wanted to mention is that... Um, uh, there was also um, there was also a documentary about the Karl Koch case. Um, this documentary was done because the case got all this attention again due to the the big movie. And um, for this documentary, um, they uh, for this documentary they talk about a f they, they talk with they speak to a former colleague, a former colleague of Vladimir Putin about this Karl Koch case for obvious reasons because in you know in in the late 80s uh, in the late 1980s uh, Vladimir Putin was stationed with the KGB in Dresden and he was working alongside the Stasi so there's a certain likelihood that um the Karl Karl Koch operation was running through his desk essentially um so that's a whole another interesting uh parallel here um now, um, when, I mean, the, the moment WikiLeaks became truly famous was the helicopter video. Now, this was, this was uh, a video, maybe people remember it, um, two helicopter gunships uh, flew a mission in Baghdad because um, coalition forces were regularly attacked by insurgents there. And so there was, there was uh, enemy fire, so they, they sent out these gunships. And some armed people, some armed combatants were running around. And in between these combatants, or very close to them, were two journalists. And so um, the helicopter gun gunship crew, they have these small monitors, you know, with the, the thermal optic, for the thermal optic cameras. So it's really hard to see or distinguish, um, you know, a camera, a large camera from, let's say, an RPG or an, an AK rifle. So um, there were fighters in the area, and this was kind of a tragic incident. Now, of course, these two journalists, Saeed Shimag and Namir Nor el -Din, it wasn't really smart to run around uh, that area um, with these other people. That was not really smart. So it was a tragic case. It didn't really tell us that much. But WikiLeaks became really famous really famous for publishing that um, that video. And then, of course, uh, the Iraq logs and Afghanistan logs. Uh, the source was the same as with the helicopter video. It was the young U.S. soldier Bradley Manning, who was mentally unstable. He now lives as a woman. And uh, he was this young kid who was always bullied his entire life, and he was also bullied to some degree in the military. Um, and so um, this this young kid, he had no real concept of how to judge the war and, and individual operations. So, and and Bradley Manning was tied to some hackers back home. Um, he was part of a, a scene, you know, the the hacker nerd scene, right? And so um, he was he decided to leak all these databases to WikiLeaks, and according to American authorities. Um, Assange instructed Bradley Manning uh, to gain more access to information. Now, this may be this this is going to become a very important point in the court case once Assange actually is in the United States, because it's a diff it's it's a difference 
if you have an anonymous Dropbox, you know, for submissions, um, and you say we don't know who the source is, it's a whole nother ball game if you instruct a guy in a military base how to gain more access to classified data, because at some point you're just talking about espionage, right? Um, and so yeah, so these databases they contain some interesting bits and pieces. Um, for example, these um, some of these Iraqis, um, some of these um, some of these Iraqi units, they uh, they tortured suspects. But um, it was a war, and we now know, and this is also you know interestingly in the documents, um, it was a big influence of Iran. So Iran was arming the the crazies. Iran was directing. Um, Iran was directing the crazies in Iraq, and we know who's behind Iran. It's the Russians. Yes. So the Russians, the Russians obviously wanted um, America out of the region, and here comes Julian Assange magically with these databases. And he wants to be the guy who ends two wars. Now, of course, every moron should should have understood that America could not pull out overnight um, because these crazies would take over, which is exactly what ultimately happened. And and the Obama administration they wanted a way out, and Assange gave them the pretext. And um, I was wondering about the role of the Democrats um, at at the time because. Um, in my understanding, the security measures at the forward operating base where Bradley Manning was working, um, in my understanding, the security was much better than he realized. He thought security was lax. He downloaded the databases, um, burnt them on a CD and labeled the CD Lady Gaga, right? So he could smuggle them out. Um, but probably all these military systems had software installed that was invisible to the user and would detect, you know, strange behavior. So maybe Bradley Manning was compromised from the very first moment. And also, at some point, Bradley Manning confided in Adrian Lamo, who was also a hacker and he also got into trouble once. And uh, Lamo then alerted the authorities and that's when Manning was caught. So maybe we should look at some people in the look at some people um, from the Obama administration, maybe somebody had the motive to let this progress further because somebody needed a pretext to get out of Iraq and call that, you know, some sort of a political success. So I think that that's something that people need need to be aware of and that people should look into. Um, so it was possible for WikiLeaks to, you know, take, bits and pieces from the documents and then make a story out of it with context, you know, talk about the Iranians and um, talk about the crazies that wanted to, wanted to take over the region. But no, Assange wanted the hype. He wanted the big sensation and, and that's what they did. And so who knows how many sources got compromised, you know, sources for the, um, uh, the coalition forces, you know, people and with families. And of course, once you... Once you compromise this stuff, you know the Russians have access to it. So then the Russians are going to, you know, and it's it's better than spying because they're getting it directly. Julian Assange is a is a, is a kind of freedom fighter, and uh, and so nobody gets blamed for giving all this stuff to Russia and China because they can they can actually sift through the details and pick out things that you and I wouldn't even know was giving the game away. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it's like when. Um when these big newspapers got this material, it, it was uh, Der Spiegel in Germany. It was, I think, the New York, the New York Times and the London Guardian back then. Uh, so they got the material like six months in advance before everybody else could, could look at it. And, um, and uh, I, 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 of course, I read all the reports done by these papers and they tried to degree to be responsible. They didn't want to give out... Um, details um, and what these papers uh, specifically mentioned was the influence of Iran and uh, so this this was um, there were quite a bit of um, there were quite a bit of um, you know there's, there was just so much intelligence about it from these field reports 
You know, they, they were starting to figure out where these weapons came from and where, where who was contacting what unit and stuff. So it was, it was Iran and it was also Pakistan. And um, this is not something that the activists focused on. You know, they didn't want that stuff. They just wanted America out of the region and they wanted America to look as bad as possible. Um, so for the mainstream media, it was sort of a compromise. You, you give the audience um, some juicy details, you know, some gory stories, um, but then tell the audience the context. So this is what, you know, journalists did. And uh, of course, I don't trust the Spiegel. I don't trust the Guardian. I don't trust the New York Times. Not as far as I can throw them, um, but there's some level of you know expertise there, and and you know the governments are you know of course they there are laws that would limit what a newspaper can do, but Assange and his people they were everywhere and nowhere, they they created this impression early on that WikiLeaks was a giant organization with different departments and and just experts everywhere. But as the German Daniel Berg explained, um, for a long time, it was just these two guys. It was Julian and it was Daniel. And they had one old server before they upgraded to a couple of servers. So they could not provide security um, for the data, security for the sources. They could not understand the material because they were not trained in these um, matters. And they did not have the manpower to go through hundreds of thousands of field reports. In fact, uh, if, if this book on WikiLeaks and UFOs is any indication of their understanding, they completely misconstrue everything because they're just using the communist context for understanding everything they see. So they're not even properly seeing anything. And I think, I think what really got Julian Assange in trouble, though, was that some of his WikiLeaks, he leaked things that were embarrassing to Russia. And I think that might be why the Russians uh, ended up you know, asking the, the uh, well, he was in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Uh, they, it was funny, R the Russians met with the Ecuadorians shortly before the Ecuadorians gave him over to the Americans. So I'm thinking that he did something to annoy his Russian friends. Yeah. And, and I mean, it, they were, they were getting tired of him. I mean, at some point, um, WikiLeaks, published these uh, diplomatic cables. You know, it was also a giant data dump of, um, you know, diplomatic communications. And uh, there were sources referred to or named in those documents. So this is very, very dangerous. And um, somewhere on the week... Yeah, and by the way, it was in those diplomatic cables that information prejudicial to Russia came out because yeah. it was our diplomats talking about really nasty things the Russians were doing which was what interested me in WikiLeaks is like, wow, our government isn't totally stupid about the Russians. They know that they're using the mafia, that they're using criminal organizations, that they are a criminal organization, you know, the Russian services, and that they're working against the West. Yeah. And so that was, that was encouraging. But of course, the Russians couldn't have liked uh, that part of that leak. These diplomatic cables were stored on this, the, the WikiLeaks server. Um, this was the on, this was the unredacted version. This was the, the original version of it. And uh, the, the, the files were hidden in a, a subfolder and it was password protected. It was encrypted. But then uh, many copies of this stuff, uh, the stuff, the server was mirrored, as they call it, onto other servers. So the original cables were also spread around. And at some point... Um, at some point in in one of the books on WikiLeaks, they actually tell you the password for these files, and um, and and at that moment, these journalists believed that this was just a temporary password, that this was no longer active. Um, but it was still active. The data was out there, and then of course anybody could just get the unredacted versions. So this is the level of incompetence that you saw at WikiLeaks over and over and over again, um, because they pretended to be a large organization, but it was run like a cult. And this is also something that that Daniel Berg notices. I mean, at some point WikiLeaks was attacking Scientology, but Julian Assange was acting like a guru himself. Or they attacked a certain bank, but Julian Assange wanted to hide all the money and have zero transparency. 
Um, well, what about what the rape? Doing? What do you think about Julian Assange, the rape charges in Sweden, him claiming that this woman was a CIA agent? Well, actually, I, um, I think he claimed yeah. she just had connections yeah, yeah, yeah. to the CIA through somebody else. I look, yeah, I looked what at this. At, I looked at this at the time, and and it's it's like this: um, people who people who worked with Julian Assange, um, people who were close to him, people who liked him. Several people said that he acted like Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones at the height of his fame. So he was just playing up his fame everywhere, and he was he was very pushy with women, and he wanted to meet women all everywhere, and so then. Um, when these two women in Sweden, when they went to the police, um, and this became, um, this became like a, an actual case, there was a response at some point from Julian's lawyers and people can find that online. It's, uh, it's, it's still up there. And these lawyers basically said that, okay, um, our client really wasn't nice to these women and they described the details but they say, well, it's not enough to prove a crime. But th still, there's the admission that Julian was um, acting in a uh, Julian was acting in, in a very bad way. Um, and according to and, and according to these women, these women told these stories um, about him. You know, they were surprised at, at his behavior, and they didn't understand immediately themselves. Was this a crime? I mean. They started to talk to each other, and then they talked to the police, and and it's like, I mean, it's it's a certain type of behavior, you know. They accused him of intentionally breaking a condom, um, having sex with one of them. Um, they accused him of having sex with one of them again while that person was sleeping, and she woke up and asked, um, "Are you wearing a condom?" And he was making a joke, and uh, it's it's just. I and mean, that was it, Anna Arden, right? The Swedish. Lady. Yeah, exactly. So even well, it's, even it's what yeah. Even if and, even if by by Swedish law, even if if you cannot prove a crime, it's still very questionable behavior, and that type of behavior lines up with what many others have explained about Julian Assange. Men, women, people close to him, working with him, they all describe him as this very narcissistic character. Nothing is ever his fault. When he gets accused of something, he always calls it a conspiracy. And um, it's like when he accuses the CIA, um, this is almost, well, not almost, this is exactly what... Um, this is exactly what what uh, spies will say or this, this, this character in Germany, he's accused of... Of being or uh, of having worked for the Russians, this case, this 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 court case that was going on in December, um, a foreign intelligence, high-ranking foreign foreign German intelligence agent, um, apparently or allegedly sold secrets to the Russians. And the first thing he said when he had the opportunity was, "This is all a conspiracy against me by the Americans, by the CIA. I'm completely oh, innocent. Wow, completely <laughs> innocent. It's the CIA that wants to frame me." So. Yeah, I mean, this is what a spy would say, and also this is what a narcissist would say, because this, well, this gets is like you... the dog ate, ate my homework kind of thing. Yeah, yeah exactly. That whenever this... you do something wrong, like you get caught robbing a bank, and you look up, and you go, "Oh no, the CIA did it. I didn't do it." <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like um, it's it's the archetype re reaction from a narcissist, because this is very typical um, when they would um, just just completely turn things on its head, you know, turn something on its head and say, I'm the victim here. And Julian always wants to be the victim. He's always the victim, no matter what he did, no matter what the evidence is, it's always, it's always a conspiracy against him. And um, by claiming the CIA did this to him, um, he tries to get the public's attention and he wants to create this public outcry because he may think that this outcry will ultimately help him. Right, so um, he wants this these activists to be his army. He wants to use them, um, and um, yeah, this is this is sort of his his behavior. Um, is his behavioral pattern really? This was observed by many many people, and I mentioned this quickly. Uh, I mentioned this briefly earlier. Um, so in in the nineteen nineties. In the 1990s, Assange was caught. He had hacked into American targets. And then he got off easy. 
Oh, right, right. When he got off easy in court, so people have to imagine, he could go to prison for 100 years, but he just gets a small fine because he took a plea agreement, a plea deal. So he has to pay this fine. It's on his record. And then he starts whining. He says this was, uh, uh, this was misrepresented to him. He, he, didn't, he doesn't accept this plea deal. Um, he wants to have a clean record. And, and, and the prosecution deceived him. It was a conspiracy against him. So, and that's why he's now a, a, a convicted man. Now imagine he gets off so easy and he still claims this is a conspiracy against him. And, and he should get preferential treatment. He should walk free with you know, nothing on his record. It's like, wow. And, um, and um, yeah, so that was that stuff. But um, when uh, Daniel Berg, the German guy, when he left WikiLeaks, he wrote this book. It's called Inside WikiLeaks and it was turned into a movie. Um, there are some really worrying things in the book. And sometimes I don't think that Mr. Berg realizes how worrying this stuff is. Um, so, for example, there's this. Um, Mr. Berg explains the following. Uh, when he was, when Mr. Berg was in the 12th grade, so that must have been, um, so, so he must have gone to a certain type of school because only that type of school has a 12th, you know, uh, year. And so in his 12th year, he was in a student exchange program in Russia. And so he lived with a guy, he calls him Vladimir, but this is just a pseudonym. So he lived with Vladimir in Russia, I think it was Moscow. And so uh, years later, for you know work reasons, um, Daniel Berg uh, goes back to Russia, to Moscow, to work at a to, uh, to, to work on a, a, a big server room, right? And he's frustrated with how the Russians are messing everything up, so he has to fix that server room. And he thinks, well, I have to visit Vladimir again, you know, the guy that I lived with um, in the student exchange. So um, Vladimir apparently became very successful. Um, so Daniel Berg asks him, so what do you do? You know, what's what's your job? What do you do? And Vladimir says, um, I, uh, I, I give favors. That's his answer. That's his job. That's his job description. I, I, I give favors. He had four girlfriends and he gave every girlfriend a car and, and an apartment. You know, just they own the apartment now. And um, what Daniel Berg found really impressive was a piece of paper in Vladimir's car. This was a, a document from the chief of police and the document said, leave this man alone. And he describes how this guy, Vladimir, how this, uh, how this, this character, Vladimir, was racing through the streets. Didn't care about the speed limit, didn't care about safety rules, nothing. He was racing around like a madman and he had the special paper from the chief of police that said, I'm untouchable. What was Vladimir's real job? I mean, he could have said, oh, I'm, I'm in real estate or I do this, I do that. He just said, I do favors. Was this man FSB? Was he mafia? What? 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 I mean... Tell me, um, there's some kind of an intelligence connection here. Yeah, and it's like it's like Daniel Berg was not even worried about that. He's just sharing this little anecdote uh, as a curiosity, and I'm like, this sounds like an this guy sounds like FSB or mafia, which are all but, you know, but tied you see, anyways. He's directly connected to WikiLeaks people. Uh, yeah, and I so mean, of course, uh, Mr. Uh, Assange has got what 18 charges against him now for this. Uh, espionage he conducted through stealing secrets and publishing them. Um, I think there was a hearing on Tuesday in London, and I think it's the we're getting down to the last round. I uh, think that the U.S. is going to have two sessions of explaining their point of view of extraditing him. And Assange's wife and other people are claiming that if he goes to America, he's going to die. That's what they're saying. Yeah. And, and that's their claim. Now, it'll be interesting to see if that is what happens. But, of course... If the Russians can get at him and kill him, 
maybe that they'd rather have that. Yeah. You know, and then they'll blame the CIA. Exactly. They just don't know. I mean, recently, um, I think it was Alex Jones. He he insinuated that Navalny was killed by either the CIA or people who are against Russia. You know, to make oh, yeah. uh, to make Putin look bad. Same thing make was Putin claimed. Same thing was claimed when uh, Boris Nemtsov was killed uh, close to the Kremlin when he was shot. People mm-hmm. in the West, some some very uh, well-known people, actually claimed the CIA killed Nemtsov to make Putin look bad. Um, and the same pe- thing with Dugan's daughter, by the way, they claimed that the Ukrainians killed Dugan's daughter, mm-hmm. which could be true, but um, we don't know. But uh, you know, the thing is, it's more likely because their government, the whole system in Russia, is based on killing and assassinating people. Yeah, that it would it would somehow ha- some kind of internal conflict was ongoing. Yeah, and I mean, it's like um, there are people that were involved in WikiLeaks that we don't even know. Okay, so in the imagination of the activists and and the followers and the fans, you know, in this imagination, these key members of WikiLeaks that you see on television, they were always working together in an office building and you know, working on the next leak or whatever, but that was not really the case, especially in the uh, most important years of WikiLeaks. Assange was always traveling. He was always somewhere else, and he was mostly communicating with uh, Daniel Berg through an encrypted chat program. And so suddenly Assange would appear in Germany he, and just knock on the door, right? And um, And he would constantly obfuscate uh, and and just um, cover his tracks and he was described as very paranoid and um, just constantly concerned about about his own safety or that people might might track him um, but um there was a character that was apparently very close to Julian Assange a, f- uh, a 40 year old woman at the time uh, and and uh, uh, Daniel Berg is not saying the name of that person he just refers to her as the nanny because she was sort of running assange she was always in the background and solving problems does for he him. give any hints to the nationality of this person um i don't think so no i don't think so hmm. it's just it's just says a woman and she was like 40 years old and uh it would take some digging to find out um who that was but that was just a general problem of wikileaks you don't know where Assange was most of the time, who he was working with, who was instructing him, who was handling him, we just don't know, right? And so mm-hmm. people sent in this information, people donated to WikiLeaks, and it was just this black bag of this this kind of this, you know, buying the cat in the bag. You didn't know what was in it. And, um, and that's not the only thing. So people think that Julian Assange was some kind of a genius, you know, that he programmed the secure anonymous Dropbox. Well, he didn't. This was apparently another German who is also not named in the book. They just call him the architect. So he created this elaborate system of obfuscation so people could submit intelligence to WikiLeaks and have this data laundered. Okay, so um, they they call him the architect and they will not tell you who that guy was. And, um, and this is how they operated for a, um, for a very, very long time. And uh, and Daniel Berg says that he's never in his life met a stranger character than Julian Assange. And mind you, Daniel Berg was a member of the Chaos Computer Club, and uh, many hackers were strange. You know, they were on the the autism spectrum, or they had ADHD, and they were on medications and whatnot. But he said Assange was just different. He was the most he was the strangest human being he's ever seen in his life no uh, i have a i have a question for you um which since you really delved into this uh and it's about seth rich the case yeah and this is something you know i've talked to some uh famous um uh former nsa let us say um intelligence experts who did not believe the wikileaks of the DNC emails, which of right. course is what has supposedly caused people to go after Trump, that Trump got into trouble for, that um, that it wasn't done by uh, a um, by hacking, by uh, 
you know, somebody answering the, the wrong email in the wrong way, uh, a, a, a phishing attack. It yeah. wasn't done that way. It was that um, this DNC staffer named Seth Rich actually got the emails and leaked them to Julian Assange. And apparently the story is, if I, if I can remember, and maybe some of the listeners can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Seth Rich was really a Bernie guy. He liked Bernie Sanders. And he saw that the way Hillary Clinton kind of bulldozed over Seth Sanders might have actually been the real winner of the primaries in 2016. But the rules were all bent in Hillary's favor, and there was some chicanery, apparently, or at least yeah. he felt it was unfair play, and that he leaked the DNC emails because he was unhappy with the Clinton campaign. Um, now, w w and it was funny, Julian Assange was interviewed about, now what happened to Seth, R Seth, um, Seth Rich was that he was murdered he was shot, shortly yeah. thereafter. Do you remember this? Yeah, he was shot yeah, on the street. It's like four in the morning. Uh, I don't know how many blocks from his house it was in Washington, D.C. And he was shot in shot dead in the street. And there was, as I understand, there was no robbery. Nothing was taken from mm -hmm. him. He was just shot um, like an assassination. Right. And um, so and Assange later was very cryptic about how he got these emails and whether mm -hmm. Rich was involved. In fact, he almost seemed to indicate that Seth Rich was the guy, though he didn't say so. But the way he answered made people think so. And that he, you know, he kind of wanted mm -hmm. justice for Seth Rich. So what do you, did you look at this, clo at this closer? Well, it's like this. Um, sometimes sometimes the data is not well protected. So if, let's, for example, the, the DNC mails, right? Um, and, um, when a vulnerability, that's what they call it. When a vulnerability is discovered, um, word gets around quickly. So, um, one guy finds the vulnerability, then 10 others find it, or the Russians find it and others find it. And so sometimes it's difficult to exactly, uh, determine, um, who was, you know, the the thief because um these vulnerabilities spread around fairly quickly sometimes without most people even knowing about it it's when you are inside of these hacker circles you get you know you get the word hey um there's a server with a vulnerability and you can actually get stuff from there and that's how people actually um break in and, and take this information so sometimes sometimes let's say the Russians, a Russian intelligence or a, a group or a Russian, um, a Russian hacking group, uh, let's say they find a vulnerability. Um, they can use middlemen and cutouts to uh, tell some some people in the hacking scene or somebody, hey, there's a vulnerability, you can check it out. So there are many ways to have data stolen and, and uh, there are ways for, let's say, the Russians to obfuscate the role and that's why it's 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 complicated to find out who the original thief was um, because oftentimes multiple people attack the same target at the same time now these hackers they, they have automated tools they can have their laptop and then they scan entire ip ranges meaning they will check out a hundred or 500 computers uh, or servers um they will check if there are any known vulnerabilities. So for example, somebody didn't update something on the server, they're using an old piece of software or an old plugin. So they run the scan and then they find a certain number of servers that are vulnerable and then they immediately know how to break into this. And um, that's what makes it so complicated. And usually WikiLeaks says they never knew their sources. But um, with, you know, Bradley Manning, there's compelling evidence that um, they were chatting. They were chatting with each other. And anybody could enter a WikiLeaks chat and say, well, I might have something. And then this ticket gets escalated. And um, maybe you can get to speak to Assange um, directly. And so um, at some point, when Assange is in America, I think we'll get more clarity about that. Because Assange always thought his uh, chat system was um unbreakable you know because it's it's just like a it's a chat room that changes places it's almost like a um 
like a like a radio operator in the old times who switches locations, right? Or a middleman radio operator who just relays information. But um, I think that I think that um, WikiLeaks dramatically underestimated the capabilities of the the NSA or the British GCHQ because they were so far ahead. And um, we may get some interesting stuff once Assange actually is in the United States, if he gets to the United States alive, if the Russians don't kill him first. So, and what do you think about the Guccifer story, Guccifer being involved in those emails? Well, that's 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 what I what I meant by uh, different people finding out about vulnerabilities and different people stealing the same stuff at the same time. So um, you don't have to steal it yourself. You can just find mm -hmm. a vulnerability and then use middlemen and cutouts to tell some dude somewhere in the world, hey, there's a cool vulnerability. You want to check that out. And so this is how... So, uh, so a Romanian hacker yeah. who maybe knows hackers in other countries who figured this out. Exactly. So this is how um, somebody can can obfuscate his own role in facilitating a theft of information. You don't have to do it yourself. You just have people tell other people, ah, you should check this server out or this particular thing because it's vulnerable and it's easy to hack into. And um, it's got juicy stuff on it. It's got Hillary Clinton being yeah. mean to her colleagues and saying exactly. mean things about people. Exactly. And um, yeah, I mean, it's like it's like once these guys have a bit of power, they start um, they start abusing this power. And Julian, I think in 2012, uh, Julian Assange got a television show on RT, which is which is Russia today. I mean, it's it's yes, he I, did. They they cannot broadcast anymore. Um, they've been shut down. But this was a popular television station, and Julian got his show, and he was promoted. Um, to a larger audience and he was doing his um he, he was, was doing, doing it from the ecuadorian embassy in fact and, and what's really strange is there's a show if you can still see it online i advise everybody to see it it's it's a show that he interviews um the slovenian communist um slovoj zizek and oh, no. david horowitz at the same time he has david horowitz and slovoj zizek and David Horowitz, and in the middle of this interview, Slovoj Zizek has this epiphany. And he looks at David Horowitz and he says, I know what you are. You're a communist with a human face. <laughs> and he's like, oh, he's just beside himself the whole time. He had this epiphany right. and the whole rest of the thing, he's cracking all these jokes. And even, even um, David Horowitz is, is giggling a little bit. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. But it's like... You know, because David Horowitz, just for those who don't know, he's a famous former, he wrote Radical Sunny, he's a former American communist um, who supposedly changed sides and voted for Reagan in, in 1984. And of course, the reason he gave for voting for Reagan was that Betty Van Patter, his, his secretary at Ramparts Magazine, he had loaned her out to the Black Panthers and they murdered her and hmm. dumped her body in Oakland Bay. And uh, I guess they tortured and murdered her first. There was an accounting glitch apparently in the communists don't like accounting glitches. Um, and so he felt that now communism is evil because they murdered his accountant. Um, but then this letter appeared from Betty Van Patter's daughter in the San Francisco Chronicle saying, David Horowitz is a liar. My mother was never his friend. He didn't get her the job at, uh, at, uh, with the Panthers. He didn't do this. And so his whole reason in his book for changing sides and dumping communism and becoming a uh, a Reagan voter was just blown up, mm. you know, by the daughter of the lady that he claimed to be guilty of of of, of uh, being part of her death. So uh, anyway, so to have Horowitz on the same show with Zizek and having that event, and of course a clueless Julian Assange, I think uh, a lot of the audience was clueless too. They didn't get the inside yeah. joke that Zizek did. And there's so many shady characters in all of this. Of course, there was um, Roger Stone um, at some point. Um, Roger Stone at some point worked for Alex Jones. And uh, also Jerome Corsi worked for Alex Jones briefly. And, um, and there were some shenanigans where Rogers, Roger Stone was bragging that, you know, he had connections to WikiLeaks of some sort and also to the Trump campaign. 
Um, Which got him into trouble. Yeah, it? and and of course, um, you know, this was this was uh, a very important. This, this was a leak done by WikiLeaks at a very convenient time, and so people started to look into that. And and then this, that's when Roger Stone um, backtracked and he said, "No, nah, I was just bragging. I didn't have any real connection to WikiLeaks." And, In other uh, words, he was lying, right? Was I, I don't, himself. I don't, I don't trust the guy, and um, and. It's it's a bit it becomes a big problem because I think that Jerome Corsi uh, at some point started to spill the beans and um, Roger Stone was not happy about that, and so who knows what other charges may be filed against various people once Julian Assange is in the United States and and has to explain things under oath and many gets convicted you know other people may get indicted as well um, because it's like you know it's 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 the allure of um, Having the option of having WikiLeaks publish something at a convenient, at a very convenient point, so we'll find well, out. Well, here's point. a sidebar on Roger Stone. You know that Roger Stone just came out with a book. I think it was last year, "The Man Who Killed Kennedy: The Case Against LBJ." Have you seen uh, this? No, I haven't seen that yet. And this is really strange, right? That suddenly Roger Stone, who's supposed to be a conservative good guy, is piling on to this 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 thing that the communists would like to blame Johnson, of course, and of course it's it's this claim that Johnson was behind the Kennedy assassination, which there was another earlier book on this. I forget the author. I read it last year when I was going through the Kennedy stuff, and I really regret reading it. It's, it was like it's like I lost IQ points because this book had no evidence. There was not no. a shred of evidence in the book. It was just about how LBJ was corrupt, and somehow that proved that he killed Kennedy. Right. Yeah, it's like it's like they they pile on they pile on so many things, and it's always the same framing. And you know, the the basic framing is always the same, and that's when when you when you um, condition the audience long enough over decades, um, they will jump to conclusions. You know, when there's a new thing, yeah. they will believe, oh, it's exactly like this older case, and and exactly like this other older case, and every case right. is the and same. You know, it's always the same. It's always you know the CIA. Yeah, and it's, a, it's always an alibi for the KGB and yeah. the Cubans. Always <laughs> exactly. an alibi. No. It's like you just gave them an alibi by, by making yeah. somebody else guilty. I mean, it's just uh, it's ridiculous because. When you go through it carefully, you see that there was, I mean, this is the weird thing. John F. Kennedy was shot by a self-described Marxist, Lee Harvey who, Oswald. Who we spent time to, in the Soviet Union. Can, yeah, who defected the Soviet Union and came back with a Russian wife, uh, uh, Marina Oswald. But it's interesting. You can, I think right now you can go to YouTube and you can hear Oswald was in a radio debate in um, uh, New Orleans with another guy. And describes himself as a Marxist, describes himself as a communist. Um, uh, and, and of course, Sirhan Sirhan, who shot Robert F. Kennedy, they, they found in his in, in his possession, personal possessions, uh, like a diary saying, I want to be a good communist or things to this effect. And how the guy was, a, I mean, the PLO is a communist organization. Yasser Arafat was trained in the Soviet Union. And so you have these Kennedy brothers are both shot by communists. And yeah. that's just a fact. And it's like everything to try to say, oh, no, they were CIA agents. They weren't communists. You know, so wait a minute. <laughs> and, and and but there's never any real proof of this. It's just claimed. And they put together this convoluted series of evidence that doesn't really connect anything. And and people believe it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's like this whole um this whole WikiLeaks thing, I mean, uh, we can assume that because of Julian's father, who was also an activist, and he visited the, um, the Syrian regime at some point, and I think his Julian's father also talked nonsense about Ukraine. Um, we can assume that Julian was in, had some sort of contact with um, leftist literature. Um, apparently, Julian was not a traditional truther, so he was not into... Um, classic conspiracy media this was also a a a point of friction between julian and alex jones so alex jones infowars um he tried to have julian assange on for a long time and assange would never come on the show and alex was complaining about that and saying assange will not give us the time of the day and he couldn't figure out why um so assange not necessarily a traditional truther 
Um, unlike the infamous Karl Koch hacker from the 80s, from Germany. Um, but um, yeah, we, we can still assume that Assange was into into some left-wing literature, anti-American stuff. And we know for certain that Daniel Berg, who was very instrumental in WikiLeaks, we know he's on the left. I mean, he says he is. His wife is a communist politician in Germany. Um, and so this was, they, they, they see the world through this baseline communist framing and they were acting according to that framing. They believe they could change the world by leaking, quote unquote, um, secrets. But none of these guys had any training or any sort of specific education in intelligence matters and, and empires and, uh, you know, wars and none of that. They were simply... And of course, the really, the really dark secrets, the ones that matter the most are the ones held by Russia and China. Yeah. Those are the secrets I want to know. But we yeah. never get to see into them. We, we get defectors from once in a while, and the defectors are then dumped on and discredited, and so nobody yeah. will listen to them. I mean, there was a, a young kid. I mean, I believe he was 17 at the time when he joined WikiLeaks. Um, he has a Swedish name. I think he's from Sweden. And uh, and so uh, this kid uh, became a member of WikiLeaks, and nobody really trusted him, especially Daniel Berg. He says this this kid is strange, and he just apparently embezzled some WikiLeaks money. Nobody really trusted him, but Assange, for some strange reasons, would um, work with this kid and give this kid access. And at some point, this young guy. Um, Collab started to collaborate with the United States government, I think with the FBI, and he gave the FBI hard drives for, or copies of uh, WikiLeaks hard drives. Um, so data from within, internal communications. So this was a leak of WikiLeaks. So this is what they never wanted to happen. They didn't want um, transparency about their own organizations. They didn't want anybody to find out the truth about themselves. But it happened. So um, when Assange is is in a, an American court, we will probably get to see some stuff that was handed over by this young guy, and um, we may get some interesting uh, some interesting leads, you know, into um, into all kinds of uh, into all kinds of directions. Um, yeah, and there was this Icelandic this Icelandic um, initiative where WikiLeaks went to Iceland and they um, they were hoping to get the laws changed to where Iceland becomes a haven for essentially pro-Russian hackers and activists. So you can store all, you can put the servers in Iceland and nobody could touch them and you can harm the United States from Iceland um, and they expected that the United States could not do anything about that. So they, they wanted to have um, redundancy and, and legal safety so they could do whatever they wanted. I mean, it's a bit of a, an interesting business model if you think about it. You know, you have WikiLeaks, you get stuff sent in for free, and then you just publish it, and you get donations for that. I mean, it's, it's an interesting business model. That's pretty easy business model, isn't it? You just yeah. wait for people and, um, to send you juicy stuff and you just you just get the yeah. credit. Oh, and there's something that many people may not be aware of. Uh, it's called the Chinese package. And this is something really interesting. Um, it was mentioned in various books. I think I've read all books that came out uh, about WikiLeaks. Um, even some in Spanish. Because I was um, My Spanish was good enough at the time so I could even read a Spanish book on WikiLeaks. And um, so this was like... Um, this was like something that's very embarrassing to WikiLeaks. Um, so right from the beginning, okay, so this is when nobody really knows WikiLeaks. They're just starting to getting to gain some traction. Um, WikiLeaks is starting to brag um, towards other people, you know, to, to get their support. They're bragging that they already have hundreds of thousands of documents. And everybody was at was wondering where did they get this stuff from because nobody really knew who WikiLeaks was. How did they get hundreds of thousands of documents? And um, and so there is there were some internal communications and some statements about this. And um, what we can piece together is this: it seems like um, people, you know, 
around WikiLeaks, maybe, um, they stole material that others had stolen. And, and the theft happened during the transport of, um, of this, this, this data. Because um, it, was, it was not just the hackers and the activists using the so-called Tor network. Now, Tor is a, is, is a, a tool that, that everybody uses these days in these hacker circles. It's a bunch of servers spread all around the world. And um, if you want to send data from point A to B, it doesn't go in a straight line from A to B. It zigzags all around the world from one of these special servers to the next. And so when it reaches the destination, supposedly um, you cannot intercept it and you cannot trace where it came from. But there were flaws in the system and, and the experts have noted these flaws in the Tor network. And um, there were strong indications, and this was in various books, strong indications that Chinese hackers and others um, Chinese hackers and others had stolen information from the West, transported it over the Tor network, but some people involved in Tor intercepted the data. Because anybody can set up a Tor server or what they call an exit node. So if you know how to work the system and if you have, if you know the weaknesses, you can intercept the traffic and copy it unencrypted. And so um, this is apparently, allegedly, where this Chinese mega package uh, came from. So WikiLeaks was sitting on a lot of stuff that did not come from whistleblowers. It, it, this was not whistleblower material. This was just stolen stuff. And um, at some point, uh, Daniel Berg actually, uh, Daniel Berg left WikiLeaks and um, he took, I think he took the Chinese package with him and he destroyed it or he claims to have um, destroyed it. So, um, yeah, this is one of the biggest secrets that it hasn't been uncovered yet. What was in the Chinese package? And there were internal emails from WikiLeaks that ended up on websites like Cryptome. Now, Cryptome has been around for a long time and it sort of works the same way as WikiLeaks. They publish stuff from around the world that is somewhat secret. And, um, so, um, at some point, WikiLeaks wanted the support of Cryptome, but the guy who runs Cryptome was very skeptical. And um, um, at some point, Cryptome published internal emails from WikiLeaks. And these emails, I think they're still on the web. And um, there's one particular mail that was also quoted in one of these books, I think a, a German book by um, from authors from Spiegel magazine. And uh, in this email... It was bragged. We have all this stuff from around the world. We are drowning in data. We, we cannot even store it all. And uh, we have material on this group and on that group and on this group and on that group. And there's some cryptic references in that mail. Uh, something like when the Russians or this, this group or that group, when they bury into targets, we take that stuff. We copy their stuff and then we have it. So this is one of the biggest remaining mysteries um, of WikiLeaks, you know, this mysterious Chinese package that, um, you know, with unclear origins. Um, and, um, and so this is the level of transparency you actually get from WikiLeaks. None. They will not tell you how they operate um, and, uh, and where the stuff all ca came from and, and just none of it. I mean... People have to imagine that something got leaked on WikiLeaks. I mean, something about a bank or an organization. How do you know this didn't come from a competitor? Let's say one bank wants to harm the other bank. They steal information from the other bank and then send it to WikiLeaks and they publish it, right? I mean, how do you make sure you're not doing somebody else's dirty work? Um, yeah, this is sort of um, the legacy of... Um, this is sort of the legacy of of WikiLeaks that um that is um yeah that's going on to this very day because the methods didn't die with you know the WikiLeaks organization. So the same stuff is going on. I mean, people spread around vulnerabilities and they 
hackers, they break into these targets, they steal information, and then they try to auction it off or they sell it to some government intelligence agency or they may sell it to journalists. Um, and um, I mean, it was always sort of on the mind of certain hackers to create something like WikiLeaks and have it be a great scam. So let's let's say for example you have an org you have a group of ten hackers just hypothetically a group of ten hackers, uh, five of those hackers they create a whistleblowing organization with a website, and they run it. And the other five are not directly attached to this organization, but they go around and they steal information, and then they send it in to the whistleblowing platform and they launder the data so it's obfuscated where it came from. So it's actually one group. It's ten. It's the same ten people, and they know each other, and they steal stuff, and then they sort of launder the data, and then they publish it and get donations for it. They can monetize the material that way, and um, yeah, it's 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 questionable where all this WikiLeaks stuff came from. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's highly um. It's highly questionable where all this stuff came from, and uh, by you know, creating, you know, the th you know the thing about leaking information. I go back to the Pentagon Papers. Daniel Ellsberg. Uh, Daniel Ellsberg was a protege of Henry Kissinger, believe it or not. And of course, if you read the Pentagon Papers, which kind of is, is they give ju it's what it is is it's young left wing academics hired by the Pentagon and told we want you to write you know, different justifications for being in Vietnam. Just think of whatever you can think of. And of course, there are left wing, you know, people out of academia writing these papers for the Pentagon. So they say, oh yeah, well, we're there for, you know, tungsten for light bulbs, because if we don't defend Vietnam, we won't have cheap, cheap light bulbs, which is, it was just nonsense. It was idiotic nonsense, but they would, they would try to make it sound like imperialism because that's what they believed. <clears throat> that America was in Vietnam for imperialistic reasons. So then you go and you leak these papers. So the left goes and leaks the papers that leftists in the Pentagon created out of their mm. minds, out of their twisted perspective. And it's, oh, how evil the Pentagon is there for these. It's like, no, you idiot is a protege of Henry Kissinger. <laughs> and then the real irony is Nixon didn't care. He says, well, that's the Johnson administration. We didn't do that. I don't care about that. And Henry Kissinger comes to Nixon and says, Oh, you were um, you're, you're you're looking weak. You can't look weak, Mr. President. You have to do something to Daniel Ellsberg, which then brought in the White House plumbers to uh, to go uh, break into Daniel Ellsberg's psychiatrist's office, right? Which it, it just makes it's just the bungling and our own left wing idiocy is being exposed. That's all that's happening. Yeah. You know, it's I mean, like a it's a tail chasing. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's it's fascinating to me that um, Mr. Daniel Berg never got arrested or um, that he never seemingly got into trouble with the Americans, even though he was involved in all of this, very deeply involved. I mean, he admits in his book that um, by putting out so many documents, um, Body Rock in Afghanistan, it was fairly easy to deduct who was an informant, who was helping the coalition forces against, you know, the radicals, the crazies. And so this endangered a lot of people and their families. But um, nobody ever apparently bothered Mr. Daniel Berg, even though everybody knew who he was, where he lived. Um, he was he was very easy to find. Now, um, in Daniel now, Berg and Daniel Ellsberg, really? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Daniel. Not the coincidence. Dan, Daniel Berg. It's pretty funny. And, and um, now there's a there's a specific. Um, context when it comes to germany right so when uh when when world war ii was over um american american military intelligence rebuilt everything here so the political system restarting the co the corporations and and setting up you know um the telecommunications industry and all that so of course, um, counter counterintelligence was built into everything from the very start. Now, of course, these these left wing guys they always say it's it's the fascist imperialist pigs. But I mean, uh, when Germany was divided, the East had an invasion army ready, and their spies were everywhere. So it's a bit of an it's 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 very uh, infantile to just 
view counterintelligence per se as as evil. Um, but um, this this system built by the Americans it runs very deep, and it's not just you know the technological side of it, um, but it's also the legal side of it. Um, there are experts, legal experts, that have written written books about this, and um, it's a very complicated system of laws in Germany. Um, that um, and and these laws make it possible for uh, the United States to conduct counterintelligence here. And it's there's so many elements of it and, and parts of it are still secret. Um, so for example, if there is an important investigation, the Americans um, they have they have the right to intervene. They have all kinds of um, privileges to take over the investigation. I think they can pretty much extract anybody, any source, uh, take over any case and, and just handle these things. Because, you know, frankly, uh, we can't handle anything. Um, German intelligence was terrible. It was always infiltrated by, by the Soviets. And so um, we're idiots when it comes to that. And, um, and so by with these existing laws and regulations and mechanisms, it is quite staggering to me that Daniel Berg was uh, never never got into trouble. Maybe he did. Maybe it was all very covert and he's not really at liberty to talk about this. But this is something that people need to be aware of when it comes to this case um, that, um, you know, the number two of WikiLeaks at the most important time, the number two of WikiLeaks was a German guy and he was handling the most important stuff because Assange was... He was almost, he was like Assange must have been like on the autism spectrum or had ADHD or something because um, Assange was always late. His organizational skills were terrible. He couldn't find his way to a destination. Um, Daniel Beck says he would get lost in a phone booth essentially. Now, p- if people actually remember phone booths, uh, and so. Um, so uh, Daniel Berg was handling a lot of the internal tasks, and and he was he was WikiLeaks for for to a large degree. And so, um, yeah, I mean, why wasn't Daniel Berg arrested, confronted? I mean, what was going on? That was this was very very strange, um, because this all this stuff directly affected American security and American foreign policy, and uh, it's 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 weird that. Daniel Berg was was doing this from Germany, even though there is a special relationship between Germany and the United States. And also, at the height of the leaks, Assange went to Great Britain. Why? And I have never, ever heard anybody really ask the question why, and I've never heard a good answer why. Because Britain is obviously a close ally of the United States. And, um, I mean, this one country that would extradite Assange, uh, it was the one country that would extradite Assange the quickest, Britain, right? Why did he go to Britain? Uh, and it, and it, I remember the days when the leaks happened and it was a global sensation and many people just assumed that Assange was on the run. He was, he was always on the move, dodging the Americans and the CIA was chasing him. But no, he, he flew into Britain on his passport. He contacted the authorities, told him where he was staying, and uh, and he was allowed to stay. And that was really odd. And, and we know how problematic Britain is. I mean, Britain is extremely infiltrated by the Russians on all kinds of levels. Yeah, and, in uh, fact, uh, it's the country where the Russians conducted most assassinations outside yeah. of Russia. Yeah. Exactly. So wh- why? Why did he go to Britain? I mean, people make a big fuzz about the the Sweden thing when he went to Sweden and he treated these women that way and they um, went to the police and then Sweden issued a, Sweden issued the special arrest warrant. And um, when you when you were inside of Europe, um, there is a possibility that this case escalates and you can then you get deported to that specific country, for example, uh, Sweden, right? Now, people make a big fuss about Sweden and all that, but forget Sweden. I mean, Sweden could also could have also, uh, ex- you know, extradited 
deported Assange to the United States. I mean, Sweden could have done that, but he chose for to a large for a large um, amount of time. He chose to be in Britain. Why? I mean, you can whine all day about oh, he's in prison and he was in the embassy and now he's in prison and uh, and oh my God, Britain this, um, Britain that. Why did he even go there? Who protected him? Wh who in the British system actually? Uh, you know, yeah, protected him. That is also an interesting question that has not been answered um, to this yeah, very well, day. Yeah, well, in the counterintelligence game, I mean, uh, it's interesting. You've got services like M MI5 and, and, and of course, MI6, the CIA, the FBI, that have been infiltrated by the Russians. So you don't really know, given the past failures of those organizations, what the state is now um you know you know the americans wanted to get him because you know he'd he'd, he'd uh, hacked he'd been, he'd been uh publishing hacked uh secret information but britain has even more harsh secrecy laws than the united states yeah and has always cooperated with the us so it is it is a very strange point um we're we're getting close to the end of our time i i wondered if you had any thoughts about what's going to happen to Assange, do you, you believe he's going to be extradited to the U.S.? Because it looks like he is. Um, yeah, I mean, this could go several ways, of course. I mean, he tries to appear physically frail, you know, like he's dying and he's he wants to be... Um, he wants to be Nelson Mandela or something. And how, how and, old is he, by the way? Uh, I think he's about 50 now, close to 50, something like that. Is he that young, and, really? Um, well, he was um, he was uh, he was well he was sixteen in the early nineties, right? Because that's when he was arrested. So um, let's say he has, he has sixteen. Well, he, and in his late forties, then twenty six. Yeah, like like fifty, around about fifty. But he he he's acting up. He's playing this up. Like he's dying in prison, and and even when he was hauled up in the embassy, um, was it the uh, Ecuadorian embassy. Um, at some point when why, things why. Why the, you know, the the Democrats, since now Putin has admitted that he wanted Hillary Clinton to be president in 2016, and he wants Biden now to be president. I guess he's come clean on that because it's going to become apparent, evidently, uh, with the, as events unfold. But why, why did Assange go for leaking on the Democrats against Trump? I mean, I mean, for Trump. I mean, it was going to hurt the Democrats. Did he even know what he was doing? Does that go to his incompetence? What What do you think of that? Well, I mean, I don't have, I, I haven't seen a study that looked at the effect of that leak, you know. And and there's some other cases where I I would actually prefer to have some sort of a scientific study that's looking at, um, you know, the voters and, and did this actually have an impact? I mean, the Democrats claim that this is why they lost the 2016 election is that, yeah. that all that negative material, you know, reading people's um, emails will hurt John Podesta. You know, you had the spirit yeah. cooking thing, which yeah, yeah. is really big here in the U.S. The, spirit the creepy cooking stuff, thing, yeah. Uh, um, very creepy. The pedophilia, the Pizzagate thing came out of this, right? The claims about... Uh, these leading Democrats being pedophiles, that was a huge, that was just like wildfire before, right, about the time of the election and afterwards. And then you had, um, and then, of course, you had just in, just straight out embarrassing stuff that Clinton was was putting in her emails. So, yeah, I mean, but, um, but when it, it came to it, it seems intuitive that that it would have affected the election, right? Yeah, but as, at the same time, um, as I mentioned before, um, when there's a leak, usually um, more people have the same stuff. And um, let's let's speculate. Let's speculate for a moment. Let's say um, somebody got these emails and others got these emails. So the Russians know others have these emails, and the Russians have these emails themselves. Um, they can. The Russians could look at the material and say, well. It's interesting. It can cause a stir. We can have the truthers that we control um, use this material um, to basically claim all of the United States or most of the United States is, is bad and evil, and and we need Russia's help to liberate the occupied, you know, United States. 
they can they can use this um but it's not it's not so bad it's not it's not hurting the democrats too much because russia of course wants to work with the democrats so i think that maybe it was well, they, um, they already do work with them I yeah think. exactly exactly well, what's really so strange is you know putin came out you you maybe uh, noticed it he had a statement he made this was several years ago in which he said um that america that the west was ruled by pedophiles do you remember that um yeah and also the satanist stuff when he started to talk about um satanists yeah right and so this is really con interesting to me because i think that the russians have used i think the russians are using pedophile networks i think it's oh, naturally yeah. part of what they do because using sex you can't just use sex to blackmail people anymore i mean uh it, it just didn't work on clinton it it didn't work on uh, trump it doesn't hurt him that he's had affairs on his wives in the past or whatever. Um, but it's it's pedophilia is what still angers people and will totally destroy you, destroy your reputation. Yeah. So this is still uh, damaging material, yeah. blackmail material. Um, and it's very funny that the Russian leader, a former KGB guy who worked in Dresden, mm -hmm. where there was rumored to be pedophile operations being set up mm -hmm. at the time in the 1980s, for him to bring that up. I mean, yeah. what, what, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? I think that what the Russians are doing is this, the Russians will, um, the Russians will publish through others. Of course, the Russians will publish, um, stuff against, uh, the Democrats and the Republicans, not, not the best stuff, of course, just some stuff. And so that way they can get um, conservatives angry. They can get um, the, you know the left wing in America angry, and every every shocking story or whatever, every leak of some sort, it's always framed in a certain way um, that the system is rotten and we need a big change. So I don't think the Russians have been using their prime material. They're using lesser material, and I think with the the Pizzagate thing in particular, I mean, if let's say, um, let's, let's say if, if professional investigators had found um, this weird stuff about this pizza restaurant, you know, the weird talk, these pictures or paintings of tied up little children, um, professional investigators could have found out possibly more and turn this into a thing but it was just um it was just posted on the internet and that's when the truthers got this into their own hands and then they were making up stuff about you know the ba uh, secret basement that didn't even exist and they were just creating this so they just invented so so basically conspiracy theorists came along hijacked it and and completely and ruined, turned it yeah, into a, a circus they ruined yeah. what could have been a proper investigation by professionals if people remember it was a professional journalist julie k brown who brought down jeffrey epstein this was this tiny mm -hmm. woman this tiny woman who was always broke um and and uh and she was a seasoned veteran reporter and uh she convinced her boss can i do uh she framed it um she said can i do a me too story just like the Weinstein story. And her, her boss said, yeah, yeah, sure, go ahead. And she brought down Epstein. It was a real journalist, not the truthers, okay? And and so with the, the, the Pizzagate thing, the truthers, they wanted to have their day. And they made up a bunch of stuff. And um, it got attention, but ultimately it did not cause any super damage to the Democrats. In, and I in think fact, it, it got people kicked out of, uh, kicked off of YouTube. It got people... Yeah. Uh, discredited it it yeah. it, uh, it it was uh you know so, it's yeah. like they touched it with their dirty fingers and, right? and of course and this, everything it. everything played into the hands of the russians because the truthers believe that stuff anyway they believe anything um that um these truth influencers put out no matter if it's mm -hmm. completely false or it's uh you know it's only 20 percent correct they will believe it anyway but on the and other hand and they'll they'll forward it everywhere exactly so that everybody and, sees it yeah. But when the left, when the left uh, watches uh, the truthers, they are enraged. They're saying this is the big right wing world conspiracy and they're making up lies and they're, they want to have a dictatorship. So that's why we have to redouble our efforts and go even crazier. So this all plays but into the, the hands the of the Russians. But the truthers message is basically a left wing message from the right, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's like, um, 
it's like this this program f that goes back to the Soviet days. And I talked about this on the show. You know, this was even uh, Vladimir Putin involved in, in Dresden. This mm -hmm. was uh, the Stasi and the KGB. Well, they had generals going to Paris and they, meeting with truthers and saying, oh, yeah, yeah we're and behind we had, you. And we had these um, confirmed scandals, um, high-ranking pedophile scandals in Portugal. We had scan multiple scandals in Great Britain, of course, um, and also Germany. And, and so... Um, these these techniques were used um, by the Soviets, and uh, they wanted to get into everything. They wanted to get into mm -hmm. right wing politics and left wing politics and everything. So um, that's why the Russians can slowly dole out bits and pieces. And um, it's always, I mean, it's like it's like this when um, when somebody puts out a sensation, and it's really just old stuff, and it's you know. Everything has been public before. It's a bit like eh, it's a bit weird, right? And uh, so the right. Russians, the Russians never, the Russians really don't want to uh, give away their their really good stuff because that material can be used to directly right. contr control somebody. But and, when and some in fact, guy, these fake stories could be like a kind of jerking the chain of the people they have under their on their leash. Exactly. I mean, imagine when, uh, if the Russian special services have pedophiles. I mean, we had Den Dennis Hastert went to prison. He was the Speaker of the House. He was a yeah. Republican. He went to prison for a pedophile related crime. I think, I think that's what it was. Anyway, so, so you have, you do, it is a thing that happens in, in, a, in politics and, and I'm sure in Europe and in the U US. And so if the Russians can get uh, somebody irresponsible to talk about it, it not only makes people shy about looking into it because all oh, that stuff is just lunatic fringe stuff that doesn't happen but at the same time they're they're kind of hinting or frightening the people that they do have on a leash the people they do have yeah. are holding this over it's like oh my gosh are they going to reveal next, my yeah. name you know yeah i might i might be next so then yeah. they're more eager to help maybe the russians yeah i mean people have to you know, people have to this blackmail is engaged People have to imagine. People have to imagine the following scenario, right? So, um, the Russian, the Russian intelligence service, they find out that um, some hackers somewhere they got access to something that's you know interesting, right? But not not earth shattering, but in interesting. So then, Russian intelligence would uh, try to figure out how to use that in public, how to because it's going to come out anyway. And um, so they make uh, they have a conference and they internally and they figure out how they're going to play this how they're going to use different types of media to make a thing out of it and um and because they know this material is out there anyway it's it's going to come out one way or the other and um so uh um the the real good stuff is still hidden in in the russian vaults um but when somebody finds something sure they can latch onto that they can uh figure out how to make a a story out of it and a story is always the same framing you know the west is rotten everything is rotten and and we need a revolution because um you know there's no other way in the political realm to get rid of this conspiracy because the republicans and the democrats they have like this almost like this eternal 50 50 balance so you, you do all this activism or standard activism, which is not good enough. And um, with the standard activism, you, you never reach your goal. I mean, the leftists, they never get full control of the country. The conservatives never get full control. And so um, then the, these Russian campaigns create this impression you cannot win by political means and by activist, uh, regular activist means. You, you got to have something stronger, something more violent and crazy and um um and ultimately the russians could decide you know when things become unstable in america the russians could decide um how this is going to play out because they always have the better material on hand and they can selectively decide okay let's burn this guy or let's burn that woman and have it you know go a certain way well i, th I think the thing that i want to end on is and this is the thing that i worry about is that how can we ever get a sensible political party or you know either political party to behave or to see things properly when they can't see who their real enemy is and they can't recognize that their enemy's methodology is to infiltrate them and then to manipulate them 
within their own camp to manipulate their thinking, to manipulate their perceptions. I see this on the Republican side. I see this on the Democratic side. I see it on both sides. And I see this divide widening in the U.S. between the left and the right. And it's it's very concerning because if there's a civil war, this is the ideal scissors strategy by which a foreign power that's infiltrated both sides can can make the war come out the way they want it to get to so that they can destroy the U.S. And um, and and if nobody recognizes that, everybody will just simply fall into the trap. Yeah, in the I mean, it's like um, it's like this when uh, when somebody I mean, we had this case and I, I write about this in my in my new book, uh, Real Anti-Communism and, and the Third World War. There was this left wing German politician. Um, Uh, Mr. Idati, he had a migrant background and he was the rising star of the Social Democrats. And the Social Democrats, according to the highest ranking def Soviet defectors, uh, the Social Democrats are Moscow's tool, basically. So he was he was rising up. Uh, he could have been chancellor one day or a, a minister one day. Um, but then he bought these nudist videos um, from the US or Canada um, because this material was at the time by some considered legal. Um, it was sold everywhere. Uh, it's these videos shot in the former Eastern Bloc, um, videos of young boys playing naked. So he bought this stuff, thought he was never going to be found out. But um, then this um, company that made the movies or distributed the movies, the company was raided and um, an investigation took place using the customer customer database. And his name was on it. And um, he sent out his lawyers uh covertly to talk to the government you know saying can we handle this you know can, can we keep this out of the press please because it's bad for me and um but it ultimately became public knowledge and so um yeah he bought he bought these uh these uh, kitty nudist videos and when the police raided his places um where he worked and lived um magically There were no internet capable devices, you know, everything was just gone. Uh, and um, yeah, and it's, it's like, this is, this is the kind of thing that people have to be aware of, that somebody does something like this and, um, you know, the Russians may find out about this. And no matter what this politician claims um, about his convictions and about what he wants the world to be like, in a situation when somebody like that is confronted, It's all about survival. You know, it's all about survival. It's not about the country. It's not about policy. It's just about that person's survival. Because when you're caught with, you know, kitty videos, I mean, it's not just your career is over. Your life is over. That guy left Germany. He may be in Morocco now and has probably has a long beard right now and uses a new name. I mean, your life is over. Um, and... Um, And this is why um, this is why people have to t be a part of counterintelligence. You know, they, people need to have a basic understanding of counterintelligence and how the Eastern Bloc is is working, um, because you 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 shouldn't you shouldn't be under the control of a president or a chancellor or a minister who downloaded or bought you know these kitty videos and then you know became an Eastern asset. You know, it's just This is just yeah. Um, that's a very bad, bad thing for your 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 leaders. And this is what I mean. This is to. what this is what we have. This is what we have the 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 NSA for and the GCHQ because I mean just from the databases. I mean he used if I remember correctly he used his credit card. He used like a Visa or a Mastercard of some sort or whatever, and and this must have raised flags somewhere. You know, this is why we have the NSA and people like Julian Assange or the Chaos Computer Club, they hate the NSA. They they do activism against the very same tools that we need to catch these people before they become chancellor or something of that nature. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you, Alex, for your presentation on WikiLeaks, and I think we covered a lot of it. I want to thank the viewers for joining us. Uh, for another edition of Friends and Enemies, I'm Jeff Nyquist in the United States, and with me has been Alex Benish in Germany. Thanks for joining us.